Hello and welcome to this episode of Quality of Life. I'm your host, Dave Augustine. Today we're talking about family and sports medicine. Joining us to talk about this topic is Dr. Jose Armendariz. Welcome to the show, Dr. Armendariz. Thank you for having me. To start out, could you give us a brief background of your experience in sports medicine and family medicine? Yes, so I'm a Prevea primary care sports medicine physician and I take care of general medical conditions as, as well as sports medicine related uh, injuries in the Sheboygan and surrounding areas. Okay. Do you care for athletes, non-athletes, or people of all ages, or what's your basic practice make up of? Yes, right now my uh, practice is made up of 50% uh, family medicine patients as well as uh, sports medicine uh, patients. Uh, and we, we take care of athletes, non-athletes, and even injured uh, uh, workers in industry accidents. Okay. How long has sports medicine been around or in practice? So sports medicine as a practice is relatively new. Uh, it was a subspecialty of family medicine along with other primary care fields since the 1990s. Okay. Um, how did it come about developing into its own discipline? Yes, so uh, as far as uh, developing br or branching as a subspecialty, the, uh, the primary specialties such as uh, pediatrics, uh, family medicine, ER medicine, and uh, PM and R medicine, um, those have been around for a while, family medicine being my specialty since the 1970s. Um, but as of the 1990s, it, uh, it turned into, into a subspecialty within uh, family medicine. Okay. So it has all the certifications, board certified, and all those is recognized as a, as, as a discipline as well. Yes. Uh, with uh, with a, a sports medicine uh, specialty, this requires board certification in family medicine and an additional certificate of uh, advanced qualifications in the field of sports medicine. Okay. Does that then require somebody, do they go to medical school and then go to additional training for sports medicine or is it all rolled into one curriculum? Yes, uh, so in addition to uh, four years of medical school, uh, there is a uh, accredited uh, residency program in family medicine in my case. Um, and then beyond that is uh, an additional year in a fellowship program uh, specializing just in sports medicine. Okay. Could you go into some of the differences between regular family practice medicine and sports medicine? Absolutely. So the, the biggest difference is, is, is basically the training. Um, besides being uh, board uh, certified in family medicine, able to take care of general medical conditions, um, I did the additional uh, uh, year of uh, training in sports medicine, which allows me to uh, coordinate care with uh, uh, athletes and non-athletes, musculoskeletal injuries uh, on and off the field. Okay, why is sports medicine unique? So this is the, uh, my favorite question. Mm -hmm. uh, sports medicine is unique and in its own way, it's, uh, it gives me the ability to take care of uh, athletes of all types and just active people of all types, uh, whether they're training for an event, wanting to be more active, or just wanting to learn more about uh, increased activity as it pertains to their overall health. Okay. Are there different approaches or different kinds of, of sports for the types of um, sports medicine? Um, as far as sports-related injuries and, and uh, uh, the approach goes, it's very specific to the type of activity. Um, as far as treatment of the injuries, it's pretty standard. You can roll your ankle playing basketball. You can roll your ankle walking down a flight of steps. Uh, so that isn't as tailored. Uh, as the preventive uh, portion of it. So the, the, the specifics of it more, more or less lie in the, uh, in the prevention. Okay. With sports medicine, I mean, there's the care and actually physical injury that, you know, people may get while playing sports. What about, you know, once they have it, you do your thing, what about rehabilitation or recovery type procedures? So this is, uh, this is basically the meat of what we do. We, uh, uh, we focus our attention on uh, as quick and safe recovery as uh, possible for the athlete or non-athlete and a, a quicker, safe return to their activity, whether it's work or, or uh, sport. Okay. Yeah. Does the sports discipline also have um, psychological rehabilitation? You know, if somebody who's, let's say, a high schooler or even a pro athlete 
you know, they have a promising career and all of a sudden they blow out their knee or something and their career is pretty much done. I'm sure that's something that they have to cope with as well. Yes, this is a, a very important question and, and often not as well addressed as we w would like, but uh, there is a big component of, uh, of behavioral health, psychological uh, component to athletes and in, in the setting of injuries. Uh, a lot of the student athletes are, are athletes first. Uh, they're doing a, uh, a student uh, career plan and then once that injury comes along, then they're left questioning, what, uh, what do I do next? Right. How is this rehab going to impact uh, my level of activity that I was before the injury? Okay. Could you step us through, you know, from a youngster to all the way through up, you know, how they may be involved with sports medicine? Or when did somebody really get involved where it's considered that? Absolutely. So uh, my ability to incorporate sports medicine uh, basically in all stages of life begins with, uh, uh, it could be something like a uh, newborn exam on a baby that might be two hours old, looking for hip clicks, looking for hip dysplasia. Mm -hmm. And as they develop, taking care of overuse injuries uh, as a child um, and, uh, and on even into uh, arthritis as adults. So it's full spectrum. Yeah. Okay. Um, do you see as, you know, they grow older into it, you take different approaches versus, you know, youngers versus, you know, now you're in high school or even to the pro level? Or is it more aggressive as you get older or? Absolutely. So everything's tailored. And as far as their, their uh, uh, conditions go, it's, it's specific to where they are in life. Sometimes it's a growth plate type of injury. Sometimes it's, it's a uh, overuse tendon type of injury. And other times it's, it's arthritis. So it's, it's very tailored and uh, level of activity, whether they're uh, high school, collegiate, uh, or just uh, uh, a weekend uh, uh, person doing uh, um, intramural sports uh, is all taken into consideration. Okay. Um, is your role in sports medicine coordinating other resources as well, say surgeons or other medical teams, or do you in your uh, practice or discipline perform that yourself? Yes. So. We, we do is, uh, is we coordinate care with other specialties, whether it be uh, orthopedics, general surgery, uh, gastroenterology, uh, psychiatry. Mm -hmm. um, we coordinate care uh, with the specialties and with uh, the teachers, the uh, coaches, and the athletic directors, along with the parents and, and the athlete themselves. Okay. Do the care plans differ for the path of recovery in sports medicine versus, let's say, somebody has a traumatic event or through emergency type um, injuries. Yes, uh, so the, uh, the care and the return to activity is very uh, tailored. A lot of times uh, rehab for six weeks would mean the end of their complete season. So, uh, so that has to be taken into consideration and uh, it's no different when we treat uh, non-athletes uh, wanting to return to work. We kind of treat them like uh, athletes themselves. Nice. Say for somebody, let's say who's disabled, you know, and they want to play sports, you know, or they have some type of a condition. Do you work with those type of people as well to help them graduate more into sports and work with them? Yes. Uh, so we always recommend uh, health and uh, and uh, activity, yep. and uh, special populations uh, is no uh, exception. Uh, we do uh, pre-participation physicals uh, prior to their activity beginning, and uh, we take special considerations for for certain conditions that may require special imaging or, or, or other uh, attention that's, that's normally not uh, uh, common in, in regular sports physicals. Okay. Um, with the different types of sports that are out there, let's say you've got football, basketball, wrestling, you know, do you see different types of injuries or different types of approaches you take for those? Uh, yes. Uh, so the, uh, the approach has more to do with the, the prehab or the prevention of injuries uh, with regards to the sport than it does the injury itself. So you can, uh, again, you can break a finger, you can roll an ankle doing just about any kind of sport, uh, but it's that hamstring prevention mm -hmm. for, that, for the soccer player, it's the skin prevention for the wrestler and things like that that's more tailored. Yeah. Okay. Um, you now you speak about prevention. Is there anything that athletes can do themselves to help prevent you know, injuries when they're playing sports? Yes, uh, we, we uh, educate patients in the, in the office, in the training room with regards to uh, pitch counts uh, so that they don't overthrow and, and predispose themselves to an overuse injury. 
Uh, we talk to them about preventive or even prophylactic treatments with, uh, uh, with antivirals for known skin conditions during their, uh, during their season. Okay. Um, we also have different types of athletes. Those are who are really like in school sports, they have their seasons and then they wind down, you know, and then they have to wait till the next year. Let's say if you're a wrestler, you know, you, you're all that and then you gear yourself up to, um, you know, get in shape or cut weight, you know, so to speak or whatever. So you have those types of um, athletes. What do you recommend like for dietary or ways to keep in shape for these types of athletes? Absolutely. So there, there is uh, 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 more of a push towards prevention, and it could be anything from maybe visiting with a, a nutritionist, or we talk to them about nutrition, about health, about stretching. Uh, these athletes are growing uh, mm -hmm. as we speak, and they, it predisposes them to tendon uh, strains uh, and tears. So there's a, there's a maintenance that needs to happen if they really want to consider uh, a uh, future in, uh, in continued sports as a mm -hmm. student athlete. Right. I know when I was in wrestling, I didn't have a problem with dietitian because I was heavyweight all the time. So looked yeah. at the lights a lot too. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> but I remember, you know, getting in shape. You know, that's like you said, you kind of, you know, lax off or throughout the summer and fall. I didn't play football, so a lot of the other people on the wrestling team played football. So rolling right in, they were in shape where I had to kind of gear up. So I mean, there was a lot of aches and pains and muscles the first week or so of practice. You know, to stay in shape. So. Um, any do's or don'ts that you can recommend on things like that? So the, the do's or don'ts uh, mainly reflect back to the conditioning. The two a days, that takes all levels of all athletes, kind of lumps them into one and, and it pushes you through some rigorous uh, exercises. So if, if you know that that's coming, which they do, um, the important thing is, is to make sure they do preventive types of, uh, uh, of, of exercises, whether it be stretching, whether it's starting earlier on your nutrition, getting things on track uh, for the things down uh, that are coming down the pike. Yeah. Okay. What advice do you have for the weekend warrior as far as, you know, activities, you know, softball season's coming up, you know, as far as that goes. So in baseball season, things like that, you know, they get out on the weekends and go, and you know how that goes, you're all energetic and, you know, give it all out and then Ooh, I threw out my shoulder or my arm. So the weekend warriors, uh, or, or the, anyone that wants to be more active than they actually are, have other special considerations. I would ask them to consider the activity that they're wanting to do for the first time or wanting to incorporate. Uh, I would also ask them to consider their current medical conditions. Um, and uh, oh, if they have any questions, they can certainly contact their primary doctor or, or someone qualified in sports uh, uh, injuries to make sure they do a, a proper assessment, make sure they're not on any medications that's, mm -hmm. that are going to be counterproductive or even hurtful to their, to their goal of becoming more active. I would think you also have a background in emergency medicine because probably in the acute cases, a lot of those types of injuries may come first to the emergency room and then they come to you, know, to you for you know, probably recovery or how to treat it. Yes, uh, so uh, in, uh, in, in residency, I uh, worked as an ER physician uh, as, in, as far as moonlighting goes. Um, I was an uh, uh, orthopedic technician in the Army, so I'm, I'm familiar with acute injuries, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that's what we do as far as sports medicine goes. We take care of uh, kids in the clinic, and in addition to that, on the sidelines, or on the wrestling mat, or on the uh, uh, volleyball court. Um, Absolutely. Okay. Getting back to, you know, family medicine versus the sports medicine, what are your driving factors of how you treat a wound versus one side or the other since, you know, you do both, you do both um, disciplines, you know, how do you distinguish the two? So it's, uh, it's, it's, there's less of a blur as far as distinguishing family medicine and sports medicine. Um, the, uh, the added field has actually given me a more of an emphasis on, on physical activity and improving quality of life through more than just uh, chemical management with a mm -hmm. medication or, or, uh, or an analgesic so, or a pain medicine. So what we do is we encourage movement um, and, uh, and tie that in uh, nicely to uh, family medicine. I mean, that would make sense because with the sports medicine, it's more activity, staying healthy, staying active, rehabilitation, repetition versus, like you said, okay, we take a aspirin a day for this or whatever. So, which then again would promote 
you know, good health because then your weight goes down, you stay healthy, your heart and your cardio system and everything works better. Absolutely. So um, what are some of the injuries that you see on a regular basis when it comes to sports type injuries? So the most common uh, type of injury is an overuse injury. So this is something that, that can happen in your knees and your shoulders and your wrists from a repetitive task that you've never had before. And it doesn't necessarily have to be during a sporting event. Uh, you can get the same uh, tennis elbow from not playing tennis, just at your job, as you can from a, a match, a tennis match. So the most common thing is, is overuse injury. As far as uh, the, the injury type, it's, it's a lot of it's season driven. Uh, depending on, on what the athletes is exposed to or what the individuals are exposed to. We're coming into the spring season, so I would suspect more mm -hmm. outdoor kind of stuff happening. Yeah. Okay. At what point would you think that an athlete should, you know, say, you know, I've really got to get this looked at, you know, and distinguishing between, oh, it's just a kink, it'll work its way out versus, no, I should get this checked out? Yes, so I have some general rules that I tell uh, athletes and non-athletes. Uh, number one, if the pain is two out of ten, and you've rested it, you've iced it, and it's still lingering, it's been a week or two, uh, don't ignore that pain. Uh, if that pain modifies the way you do your activity, if you're running and now you have to run in a different way and you've rested and iced it and, you, and you've honestly uh, given it a week or two and it's still the same kind of pain. Uh, or if that pain is the focus of your activity. So you can't run without thinking of this knee pain, you can't run without thinking right. of this ankle pain. Um, those are the kinds of of uh, warning signs that I would say, you know, your body's telling you to do something different and maybe have it looked at. Um, in, because rest, ice, ibuprofen, or Tylenol are not enough. Right, mm -hmm. and I would think you'd want to get it looked at because, you know, like with anything else, if you get a limp and you start limping or running indifferently, you can throw other things out of whack and actually cause more, more harm or damage to other parts. You can, it's like a uh, wobbly wheel on a, on a car. It'll start shaking other things up, absolutely. So. Okay, let's say I'm getting older, but I still have the passion to run. Well, not me, maybe, but you know, other people, you know, passion to run or be active or do whatever, even to, well, I am a hunter. I like going in the woods, you know, so I am active in the woods in the fall, you know, in winter and stuff. So as you get older, you know, are there certain things that a person can do to, you know, help along, especially when the joints get over? Do you start, you know, wearing knee braces, wrapping up, or how does, how can somebody, you know, take preventative medicines or help around medicines, but to help with activities that they can still be fully active. So that's a, that's a very important question. And as we age, it doesn't mean that we have to move less. Um, you're absolutely right. Something even as is, is, uh, complex as hunting requires a lot more senses. So the important thing is to, uh, to find out what the, the limitations are as far as the activity goes, see what uh, your overall health is, and then as far as uh, uh, medical conditions go, see if it's safe to do so. Um, a, a good example is, is having arthritis. It doesn't have to slow you down. It actually likes, arthritis likes for you to have movement. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you have bad knee arthritis, then running wouldn't be something that would be ideal. There's other things that you could do to keep you active and healthy. Okay. Um, any does, um, infectious diseases or other types of viruses or things, you know, that especially going around this day and age, you know, with everything going on, does that affect, you know, an athlete or their ability to perform? There are. Um, uh, skin conditions are the most common thing, especially amongst uh, wrestlers. But anything from a viral illness, uh, like uh, infectious uh, mononucleosis, can affect uh, the size of your spleen, can affect the size of uh, uh, the, the energy level you may have. And uh, as far as uh, activity with a fever, that's something that needs to be evaluated mm -hmm. to make sure that you're you're okay to continue doing that type of training or activity while you're sick. Okay. I go to the Walgreens and I look at the shelf and there's all kinds of, you know, body enhancement things to, you know, the days of Mark McGuire when supposedly he had his home run thing and he was taking supposedly a non-prescription, you know, enhancer or stuff. Um, any of those, you know, don't stay away from them or, or do, do they help or, you know, should somebody stay away from them? So this is a uh, common question that I get uh, all the time in the office. 
uh, the most uh, common product of uh, being something like uh, glucosamine chondroitin for the joints and uh, what they should do and what they should not do. Uh, the evidence shows that if you try it for a good six weeks, 12 weeks, and it shows effect, then you can continue a supplement like this for your joints. If it does nothing, then I tell them, you know, save your money, mm -hmm. don't take, don't uh, buy anymore, and uh, and uh, let's uh, let's talk about other options, whether they be uh, gel injections for the knees or or some other uh, uh, functional rehab for that uh, for that knee pain. Um, but there are a, a ton of supplements, and the most important thing is to bring them into the office, uh, have us take a look at it, and make sure that not only are you getting the right amounts of these supplements, but they're appropriate for the activity or the purpose that you want them for. Okay. So is there certain lab tests that you do to keep you know, track of a person's health or an athlete's health, you know, that you do either from blood draws or whatever? There are uh, recommended uh, lab tests and they mainly center around um, uh, the patient's ages. Uh, they center around the patient's medications. If they're on certain high-risk medications for electrolyte imbalances, then those things are checked. Uh, cholesterol is an important one to check. Uh, they all have their, their uh, times that we uh, begin to monitor these things. And it's, they're not routine, but they're more uh, specific for the patient and their conditions. Okay. Along with that, uh, dietary um, requirements, let's say for an athlete, is there different um, dietary requirements that they should follow? You know, like you see, like you have the Rocky show or Rocky Balboa and all those big glass of eggs, you know, is that really do anything with the protein or is that just a movie stunt or whatever? I guess, what should an athlete's diet really be composed of? That is a well, uh, that is a uh, good source of protein eating raw eggs, although it's not tolerable to a lot of uh, people. Um, as far as the diet for the athlete, it's, uh, it's athlete specific. Wrestlers have different requirements. Football mm -hmm. players have different requirements. Um, Bodybuilders have uh, different requirements, and even uh, long-distance runners. So they, this is all tailored and uh, and, and discussed at their uh, at uh, the patient's uh, visits. You know, it always is important to stay hydrated as well. You know, you see them. Gatorade was always the big drink on. You know, you see them on the sidelines and everything at the football games and such. Um, is that really an important factor? And what's the best um, way that a, an athlete can stay hydrated? Is it just good old-fashioned water, or is like a drink like Gatorade or better, or something else that puts the vitamins back in quicker? Yes. So hydration is always important, especially when you're doing a lot of uh, sports that uh, uh, that uh, end up with a lot of electrolyte loss. Uh, Gatorade and and these uh, sports drinks are good for replenishing electrolytes. Uh, so those are important to use in, in that time. Uh, but for the most part, water does a great job uh, as far as hydration goes. Okay. What are some of the other physicians that you work with as far as their disciplines on a common basis? So the physicians I work with uh, cover all, all disciplines. Uh, and that could be anything from surgeons uh, of all type um, to other primary care specialties, such as pediatrics, uh, internal medicine, um, and uh, and uh, psychiatrists, yeah. but it covers all uh, all specialties uh, and uh, nutrition as well. Okay. Yeah. In an athlete's training program, I mean, like some of them, you see they're lifting weights or they're running or to get cardiovascular. What mix do you say they should follow versus you know cardiovascular versus you know weights or or restriction type exercises? So those are, uh, th those are good questions and they come up uh, very often. Uh, as far as aerobic exercise, for somebody that's uh, a an athlete, it's, it's pretty much dictated by their, their coaching staff and their strength and conditioning folks. Uh, the everyday person, I always say uh, 30 minutes of uh, aerobic exercises, two to three times a week, and that aerobic exercise could some, be something as simple as walking. Mm -hmm. uh, the exertion level of it could be fast enough to have this conversation we're having right now. And the nice thing about aerobic exercise, if you get 30 minutes, it doesn't have to be in one straight shot. You sure. can do 15 minutes and 15 and use it as your warm up and cool down when you do uh, weight training too. The importance is moderation. Mm -hmm. And that's was gonna follow in my next question. That's like mm -hmm. if you're lifting weights, you don't have to be, you know, 50 pound dumbbells all the time. You could start with the five and work it up as well. And, you know, and the other thing when I did work out, I was always got yelled at because I was seeing how many repetitions I was doing versus doing the thing and then the slow to really get your workout as far as that goes. Uh, yes, uh, so there's two, uh, two uh, uh, 
functions as far as the uh, muscles go, and one's the contraction, and one's the the uh, eccentric portion of it, or what some people call the negatives. And they, they they make the workouts as far as aerobic or or weight training exercises more effective okay. when you do them both. Before I go into training, let's say, or I'm considering do that, should I see somebody like yourself first to get on a program or to look at, or just go right into it and and, and go from there? Yes, if there is any doubt whatsoever, if there are medical conditions, uh, I would uh, recommend that you see someone first just to, to assess the overall picture. If you want to do a lot of heavy aerobics and you're on blood pressure medication, sometimes mm -hmm. that could slow your heart rate down so it won't let you reach the aerobic levels that are beneficial. So a good assessment if there's any questions. Otherwise, something slow and steady would be, would be recommended uh, with any concerns uh, brought up to the to the patient's uh, uh, primary doctor. Okay, uh, the treatment for sports medicine and injuries, is that covered by most insurance plans? Yes, uh, so I'm a primary care sports medicine, so I'm a family medicine and sports medicine physician, and we, uh, uh, we have no problems uh, with uh, injection treatments that we do, with uh, medical treatments that we do, uh, and even uh, uh, some of the ultrasound uh, evaluations that we do. Um, so that's not a problem. Okay. If somebody wants to learn more about sports medicine, where are some resources they can go to for more information? Yes, so I, I direct folks to the uh, Prevea.com website. Uh, this is a source for reliable information that's printable. And any further questions, uh, you can actually uh, contact and schedule appointments with a specialist. Uh, otherwise, uh, their, their primary care doctor can uh, direct them as well. What should somebody look for in a sports medicine type physician or a program to get into? Yes. Some of the you know, things to look for. So some of the things to look for is, uh, is as far as uh, board certification, um, in order to, uh, to be sports medicine certified, uh, they also have to be family medicine certified. Um, and then just a, a comprehensive kind of uh, approach uh, to the treatment of their, of their concern or their, their condition. Okay. Any other final thoughts as far as, you know, sports medicine, your involvement with it, and advice to athletes or other people who just, you know, for general exercise? Yes, so my, uh, my advice for uh, general folks is, uh, is uh, to keep things moving. Uh, there's always a way to make things better. And if you find yourself wanting to be more active, not sure how, and, uh, and, and need a little bit of guidance uh, or assessment to, uh, to schedule an appointment and get those questions answered. I always encourage folks to bring in questions uh, that we can answer and, and get things going on the right track. Excellent. Um, any other final thoughts before we wrap? I, uh, I look forward to serving uh, the Sheboygan and the Sheboygan area more and bring in uh, more and more sports medicine and uh, into the area as far as uh, uh, my specialty is concerned. Okay. How long have you been in the area for practice, your practice so far? I am uh, six months old. Now. Six months old. Well, yes, welcome sir. to the community. <laughs> Thank you. As far as that goes. Um, this takes care of this episode of Quality of Life. I'd like to thank Dr. Jose Armandars for joining us and talking about sports medicine. If you have any other questions about this show or questions in general, you can look on our website at www.wscssheboygan.com. For Quality of Life, I'm Dave Augustine. Thank you for watching.